All right, so I guess if it's okay with you, um, I guess we'll, we'll start. Uh, so welcome, thank you for hanging out with us this afternoon to talk about tipping and compensation and uh, everything surrounding uh, getting paid in the hospitality industry. Um, I am going to, uh, in, I'll introduce myself in a, in a second um, and I'll let Kate uh, introduce herself. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is, is just so we don't uh, talk over one another, uh, I'm going to do a little intro about uh, myself and uh, about uh, what we're calling Hospitality Included um, in my company. And then I'm going to let uh, Kate uh, talk. So probably we'll each do 10 or 15 minutes of intro and then we'll answer questions after that. So I, I hope that that works for everyone um, and uh, we can go from there. Uh, so, um, uh, my name is Mark Maynard Parisi, and uh, I'm the co-founder of a place called Porchlight, which is a bar in West Chelsea in Manhattan, and I'm part of Union Square Hospitality Group, a company I've been, uh, I started as a tipped employee almost 24 years ago um, in this company. And um, I kind of wanted to talk about how I started in the industry and how things have changed, and like so many of you, um, I fell into the industry. I, I didn't go to Johnson and Wales or uh, Cornell or hotel school. Um, I didn't go to culinary school. Um, and I fell into a job uh, when I first moved to New York from Vermont. Um, I was working for an architect down the street um, from this place called Union Square Cafe and I, and I was underemployed. Uh, and so I, I took a job at, as a host um, back in the early 90s. Um, at Union Square Cafe, and that was a tipped position. And back then, like most of us, it, you know what one of my colleagues calls the Wild West of uh, the hospitality industry. Back then, um, uh, we were all paid. Uh, we were all paid our tips in cash. So we all, at the end of the night, walked with our tips. And um, while we really loved the wad of cash in our pocket, it was sometimes kind of awkward to pay your landlord in tens and twenties. Um, and so interestingly, while I was still a tipped employee, um, Danny Meyer, who's the owner of Union Square Cafe, um, and that was his only restaurant at the time, uh, decided to um, start doing tips and checks. And that at the time was a hugely revolutionary thing in our um, uh, business and in our industry. And, and frankly, a lot of us were not too happy about it. Um, but over time we, we felt like it actually gave us a certain amount of legitimacy and, and it was actually nice to, um, not get audited by the IRS and, um, it was nice to be able to pay bills. It was also pretty cool to be able to have benefits taken out of a paycheck rather than having to write a check to the accounting, um, department every, every, uh, month. So, over time, while we weren't necessarily happy about it in the beginning, it, it's something that we ultimately um, found to be a good thing. And over the next few years, most other restaurants in New York City um, changed to that kind of thing. Uh, so what I think initially for us was something that we saw as a bit of a negative in terms of recruiting talent ultimately became a positive. And, and I think that's something that I keep thinking about when I hear about hospitality included. Um, I've worked at, in fine dining at Union Square Cafe. I ultimately was the general manager there. And, and I also helped found something called Blue Smoke um, after I left the uh, frontline position and, and ended up being a manager. Um, and I'll be honest that when Danny first announced that he wanted to do tipping included or, or hospitality included as we're calling it, it was something that I was a little um, concerned about since I no longer worked at a fine dining restaurant. I work at a bar whose revenue is much, much less than uh, Blue Smoke or Union Square Cafe and whose staff, uh, we have a staff of about 30 people here. Um, so a much smaller group compared to the 175 we have at Blue Smoke. Um, and so um, it's something that I'm still concerned about and something I'm also really excited about. Um, I've, I've really, since I've seen some of my colleagues 
at our other re at our restaurants do it, um, I've started to learn a lot more and and get very interested uh, in it. Um, I do have notes over here, so I make sure I don't uh, totally stumble. Um, interestingly, back when we were at Union Square Cafe, Danny had floated the idea of doing something um, where he eliminated tipping and. It was one of those things that he actually put out in an, in a newsletter, um, and it was an idea that was way too far ahead of his time. Um, and the economics were very different. And frankly, the staff universally said, "Please don't do this." And 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 thankfully, Danny didn't, and and he listened to the staff, and and so we decided not to do that. And that was, I think, a very good thing. By that time, I had I was a manager, and and. Um, I was glad that I didn't have to uh, hire an entire new staff uh, because of some sort of revolt. Fast forward to now, um, a lot has changed. Um, and there's not any one particular thing that precipitated uh, Danny's and, and ultimately our idea to go into hospitality included. But there were a few things that I think it, we should be honest and, and talk about. Um, First of all, knowing that I work in a restaurant company, even though I run a bar that's in a restaurant company, um, we have, uh, the industry has really been struggling with, with keeping uh, talented cooks um, and, and culinary employees. And as you probably know, um, something that's happened a lot is prices have gone up. and what has happened over the past especially 10 years is that the disparity between front of house pay and back of house pay has has really um it's become a widening gap and and so much so that we have cooks working in our in our company who have struggled to decide whether they should go work for a fast food restaurant who's paying higher wages than a fine dining restaurant. And, and you can imagine having gone to, if you go to um, ICE, you know, one of the culinary schools here, or CIA, or Johnson & Wales, it's, it's a hard sell to your parents to say, you know, I'm gonna go work for a fast food chain because they pay more than a fine dining restaurant run by a, a famous chef. And so that's something that we kept hearing in interviews and, and, and we, you know, had people leaving because we weren't compensating them enough. And this is not just, Certainly, our company—it's—it's it's really um, company-wide, um, industry-wide. So that's something that we started this this gap. We really start felt that we had to start paying attention to it. Um, also, there are some law changes um, here in New York State, which is, I think, a very specific thing that you know we all of our businesses are in New York, actually, except one in Chicago now, um, and. The governor and the mayor have have um, increased the minimum wage starting January first here. Um, so the tipped minimum wage, um, which was five dollars an hour um, until January first, is now seven dollars and fifty cents an hour. Uh, and I know that varies from state to state. And and so, but but we are a New York company, and so that's something that um, we had to pay attention to. So every front of house employee, starting four weeks ago. Um, got a two dollar and fifty cent raise, and unless we did something or unless we do something, no back of house employee gets a two dollar and fifty cent raise. So, in addition to what's been happening over the past decade, a lot has happened in the past month. Um, the minimum wage was was announced only in the I think summer or fall, um, and it went into effect a, a few weeks ago. So. This ultimately, this initially kind of started as, hey, how do we how do we make things a little bit more fair? And a, a third motivator um, in in this is the idea of, of legitimacy, and and I think the the idea of professionalism. Um, like me, and and like a lot of you listening, um, who didn't go to culinary school or or you know, a, a hotel school. You a lot of people really feel like we're doing really great work, and we are professionals. 
and whether you're a, a bar back who's who's striving to become the best bartender ultimately or a food runner who's who really wants to become a great server or captain or ultimately a sommelier it, it's the sort of thing where how we are compensated or how you know the majority of our team is compensated has been sort of at odds with with the job that we do and i think that's something that we've really kind of latched on to uh, since we started talking about uh, hospitality included um and so before i talk about the mechanics which i'm not going to i'm gonna i'm gonna hand it over to kate um i think this feeling for us of being paid professionally as you would pay uh you know, as you would pay someone, an, another craftsperson uh, or an artist or a person who, who gives service um, with, who's not in a tip profession, this has been something that we've really started to hear from our teams as we've started to talk about hospitality included as a very positive thing. Uh, and I will say that The Modern, which is um, a, a fine dining restaurant located in the Museum of Modern Art that we run, they started uh, this a few months ago and Myelino, which is a uh, still a fine dining restaurant, but but not as fine dining um, as the modern, they are starting that uh, they are starting hospitality included in, on February twenty fifth, so very soon. And um, I would say that Porchlight is going to be months away. So while I'm excited, I don't want to put myself off as an expert yet, but I'm an expert watcher right now. I, I'm very much. Um, listening to my colleagues and, and seeing how it's going. Um, I, I feel like I really benefit from their experience and wisdom. And um, so this is something where we are taking both a wait and see approach and also just asking a lot of questions. And so a lot of the questions that you may have today, um, I'll be able to answer on behalf of my colleagues. And if I can't answer it, I will, um, I will be sure to you know, try to get back to you um, with with a real answer rather than just being a vague uh, give a vague political answer because that's not really what I like to do. So um, I think that was a long enough ramble. Uh, Kate, hi, hi. Uh, I am Kate Gerwin. I am the general manager of HSL Hospitality in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. So we're quite an extreme different market from you guys in New York City, but. Um, you know, this, this issue affects everyone. Uh, we are a multi-venue unit. We have three bars, um, restaurants, catering. We actually even have retail stores. Um, so <clears throat> it's definitely something that um, doesn't just hit the big cities, it hits the small cities. And I just spent last weekend in Seattle and I was overwhelmed with just, you know, every market's feeling it. Every market is going to have to adjust or do something. So I think it's good that we're kind of opening up the, the discussion um, about myself, I, I kind of started as a seller rat um, in Napa Valley. I was born and raised out there. I, don't, I think I've probably done almost everything there is to do in this industry. Um, bar backed, bartended, um, I'm a sommelier. Um, I've owned my own restaurants before. I'm now a consultant, I'm a general manager. Uh, I've even taught at two culinary schools. I taught at Johnson & Wales, uh, excuse me, not Johnson & Wales, uh, I saw them logged in. Um, I taught at New England Culinary Institute in uh, Montpelier, Vermont, and I taught for Le Cordon Bleu at Scusta Culinary Institute. Um, so I've, I've kind of done it all, um, and I, I think this is a quite a hot topic. Um, I kind of just want to get going and, and give us a chance to really talk about the things that I think are very important to everybody. Um, and I'm obviously going to speak on, on the other side and, and you know, kind of open up some discussions. So, you know, I, I, I get the talented cooks by all means. Um, I, I absolutely agree 100% that there's obviously, you know, a wage, a difference, and the cooks, you know, those, those guys make the, make the wheel turn. However, for me personally, and especially if someone is in the front of the house, I don't understand how compensating them uh, based on taking money from the servers is, or the bartenders or whoever else is the answer. Um, it, it just doesn't seem logical to me. I, I feel like it's kind of, and not to go out into the extremes, when we're talking about wage distribution, we're really getting into socialism, and who's to say that the, who's to say that the servers make too much money? Um, you know, I don't see where there's a difference in talent from saying that a, a, 
cook has a great talent, absolutely, they've got a palate and they see the food and they have a talent, but what's to say that diminishes the talents of a bartender or a server? Um, I hear it all the time with people who say, um, you know, I could never do what you do, dealing with people. Um, just like a singer has their voice and it's a talent, I think front of the house is, is a talent as well. And, and I do believe that we're, you know, in our in our group of kind of what I would say, I don't know if I'd want to call it fine dining, but just the ones that the career servers and the career bartenders. Um, you know, I, I've studied and, and taken just as much time in my career. I need to know spirits and I need to know wine and I need to know food as well. Um, I'm a certified sommelier. I just finished my Cicerone. Um, I'm bar five day certified. I go to as many educational things as, as I like to think anybody else does and I take my craft very, very seriously. And the money I think reflects in that. Um, the minimum wage, I, <laughs> I feel like that's a debate that we could probably just go, I mean, that's, that's oh my goodness. Um, you know, there's so many things about the minimum wage increase. I think for one, you know, it's on, on behalf of the restaurateurs and the owners themselves to get involved in legislation and get involved with their local lobbyists. And, you know, I don't think, I don't know one server who wants a minimum wage hike. I, I think we're all pretty happy with, and bartenders as well. I don't know one, I haven't heard if any feedback from one bartender who says, yeah, I really want that extra $2 and 50 cents an hour. Um, I think that the $5 and I think what that really comes to is, is coming together as a group and going to your, your lobbyists and your legislators and making sure that a minimum wage hike, and a tip credit is something that's accounted for. Um, I think the problem doesn't necessarily come in, okay, well, they're gonna do this no matter what, so now how do we compensate? I think as a group, we need to get together and make sure these things don't happen to our industry because in turn, for me personally, what I feel it's gonna affect our industry is service uh, and customers. And I think that you know the tipping culture is, is, is a great way for guests to show genuine gratitude. I think there's the whole incentive to sell and servers being hospitable and um, also I, I feel like it's kind of almost like commission-based work. You know, um, realtors, would realtors sell as, many, as much real estate if it wasn't based on commission? Um, you know, are servers really as a whole going to continue that, that process? And it's not, just, it's not just that, but it's the incentive to, to turn your tables and it's the incentive to, you know, sell. Um, and that kind of affects the bottom line for, for all of us. The, the legitimacy issue, I can see, I can, I can see that, I suppose. Um, for me, that's not a huge thing. I take a lot of pride in what I do. Uh, I've never felt uh, that my profession or, or whatever I do is, is beneath me, and I have never felt illegitimate by any means whatsoever. Um, I'm damn proud of my industry and my bartenders and my servers, and it's really funny to me because I meet people all the time, and they'll say, uh, what do you do for a living? And I'll say I'm a bartender. And they go, oh, are you a mixologist? Or, oh, well, don't you run bars? And I said, no, I'm a bartender. And I always will be, and I will be proud to that day. So I, I could care less what everyone else thinks, to be honest. If, if they, they don't think bartender is great, then they're, you know, that's their problem, not mine. Um, so I think, honestly, I think we all know that there's, there's an issue with tipping. I'm not saying that the system is perfect. It's clearly flawed. Um, but I don't think taking a service charge and taking essentially the money out of the front of the house and giving it to the back of the house is the answer. And I think that instead of, you know, just saying, well, we can't afford to raise our prices, guests won't like it, so we're just going to take from these guys, which we think are making too much money because they're making $30 an hour, we're going to give over here. I don't know what industry would ever really successfully, you know, handle that. And, and I don't I don't know who really thinks it's okay to just say, well, I've determined that you don't make, you make too much money. In my opinion, you make too much, so I'm going to take from you and I'm going to give to these guys that are underpaid. Yeah, I, I get it. They're underpaid, and let's fix it. But that doesn't necessarily mean for me that we take it, you know, kind of from the front of the house. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great point, and, and I agree with you more than you could even know, actually. Um, I think the, what we as consumers, so now speaking as a consumer, have sort of been artificially duped i think into understanding or into not understanding the uh the value of, of a meal or a cocktail or um the food that we eat and and uh, when we go out to restaurants and bars and and um i agree if if this were if this system only worked if everyone in the front of the house had to take a 10 percent pay cut or an x percent pay cut 
to give the back of house a 10 percent pay increase that would not work that would that would be um i think poor capitalism uh and and not very nice um <laughs> so i think you know you and i agree on that i think what the the fact of the matter is that the guest is really going to bear the majority of the um, the the brunt of of this um, change, and and the investors, frankly. Um, so whether it's um, you know a price increase that the, that the guests will see on their check, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about what our goals are with that, um, or the owners and investors saying you know for the for the meantime we're going to be willing to take uh, a little less profit just to see how this rolls out, which is what we've sort of agreed to um, for, you know, a short term. Um, that's the reality. I mean, I think the, the reality is that, you know, that $30 stake that you're maybe buying is really not $30 because you're only paying, you know, the server is getting paid only $5 or now $7 and 50 cents or, you know, 250 in some states, you know, so, so that's not the true value of that, of that piece of, uh, of that entree. And, and so really the, the sort of change, the culture change, which is going to be the hardest part, I think, is to say, is it really what's printed on the check? Or is it what I pay on my credit card? Because if you look at the check, you're going to say, my God, that that stake that was $30 is now $36 or $37. But when you get your credit card statement, the goal is that for us is that it's going to be pretty close to what it would have been before. So the goal here is not to you know rob from the rich and give to the poor. I mean, that's that's not our goal. Um, because that would, would just be foolish. You know, then we would have lower turnover in the back of house and high turnover in the front of house. And um, so that's, you know, that's certainly something that would be, I think, poor business. Um, that said, I'd be lying if I, I, if I told you that I wasn't concerned. And so what we've done actually, and, and I say we, in this case, it's not my business yet, but what the Modern and Myelino um, have done is said that for the first um, period of time, I believe it's 12 weeks at the modern. Uh, they are, they are um, telling the the service staff that we are going to keep you whole. We're going to make you whole based on what you've been making in the past. So the fear initially was that you know guests may have a concern about it and and that. Uh, cover volume would go down and, and people would say, oh, I won't have that second glass of wine because um, the prices are so high. So far, even though it's only been a couple of months, um, the modern has, has actually not seen any fall off of volume. But you guys haven't increased your prices, right? You've just done the no. service charge. No, we absolutely, no, actually, it, it's, I'm glad you asked that. Um, we just increased our prices. We do not add a service charge. Um, and that was actually, we actually spoke to several lawyers um, who really were knowledgeable about this. Um, and that was an idea at one point to, to say service charge. But now really all it says is it has the price of every menu item and then tax and that's it. Um, and there's no line for tip and there's nothing that says service charge, you know, 50 bucks. Um, so it, um, it makes it both cleaner, you know, it makes it cleaner for, for people. So they say, okay, 200 bucks, that's $200. That's how much I owe tonight. Um, I will say, you know, just anecdotally from, from the people I've heard, you know, in, in the first month it was weird because people didn't know like, wait, I heard you were starting this thing, you know, should I be giving a $20 tip? And, and, and once people, once the team, First, understood how to how to deal with you know people trying to tip and um, and the guests as guests are coming back they're starting to understand and and of course as we do more things like this and people start to understand um, it uh, it's becoming smoother you know it's it's becoming um, easier for for everyone and that includes you know the coat check you know to not have to dig five dollars out of your um, 
out of out of your pocket to give to the coat check and you only have a 20 and then you know uh, yeah it's only for two coats um so, so essentially if the, if the guest isn't paying the tip and they just have seen a menu price increase it's not really affecting the guests and I, and so how is how is the service staff made whole because the only other place it can come from is is essentially the service staff if it's not coming from profits and it's not coming from the guest right so it is so the if you if you say that in your business if, if one does an analysis and says that in your business you know the tip is x percent the the, the typical tip is x percent um it has to be a little bit more than that you know so what we are doing is we are raising prices to um to accommodate both keeping the service staff whole and uh, increasing compensation for, for the back of the house staff. Now, this is something that's going to happen over time. Um, it's not like a switch is going to ha uh, be flicked. But initially, when, when the modern went to hospitality included, they raised their prices in one day. Now, it wasn't a, a price increase across the board. You know, like any good business person, you can, you can see what you sell more of and maybe raise that a little bit more and that a little bit less. Um, and that included the wine list and, and the cocktails. Um, so, you know, we had the benefit of working with some great financial minds who, who really ran models for us to, to just say, okay, what would the effect be, you know, if we were to do, um, you know, a pricing. Are all, sorry, are all your servers or your front of the house essentially on salary or just hourly? They've had an, obviously had a wage increase. Great, great question. So what we actually did was, we um, increased everyone's uh, at the modern and what we're going to be doing at Myelino. We increased everyone's hourly wage in the front of house to nine dollars. So that that was the first, um, which is the regular um, a regular minimum wage. Um, and then what we do is we have um, uh, a, a excuse me, it's a um, profit share. So what we're doing at the end of uh, at the end of every week is we are. Um, Excuse me. I just want to actually look at look at my notes over here, so I so I actually get it right. Since since I'm not doing this yet, um, um, we actually are doing um, looking at the sales for the week, and then distributing the money based on um, job classification and experience and skill level. So it's taking all of our all of our places. Uh, excuse me. Revenue share is the word I was looking for. Um, all of our restaurants and businesses up to this point have been in a tip pool. I know, I know that might be different for a lot of the people listening. So we've been accustomed to sharing tips as tipped employees. I'm going to say managers are not sharing tips. Um, but what we've done is we've, we've changed it to a weekly revenue share. And so this is sort of the sort of thing where everyone during the course of the week will share based on the hours they worked and based on the skill level that they have. So, in the, and I'll, I can go into granular detail about that if you'd like, um, what their share of that revenue uh, share would be. And so, obviously, if you are a captain who has 10 years experience, you should, you should earn more of a share than a new back waiter, you know, just to give some of the extremes. And so, um, that has actually worked out really well. And speaking of something that worked out really well, Nick Bennett, our head bartender, I think he, I think you can sense I'm getting a little tense. So he just brought me a gunmetal blue. Thanks, Nick. Cheers, everyone. You know, mezcal is so much more soothing than tea sometimes. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> I love mezcal. <laughs> uh, as I look at your back bar, I, I see that uh, mezcal is, is uh, pretty oh, heavily, <laughs> heavily featured up there. Um, so um, it has not been without its challenges, but but the, the beauty of this is that everyone now is a whole thing too, um, not just for their shift, um, but really for the whole week. And, and, and as, as you know, all the senior servers would want to, or and bartenders would want to work Friday and Saturday night, or whatever your busy night is at you, at your place. And God forbid you should be a guest on a Sunday and Monday night. You know, we'd all like to think that our teams are all awesome, and they are. But 
someone who has five years experience at your place is probably going to know the menu a little bit better, know the wine list a little bit better. And um, so, so that's something that really the modern really love has loved so far. The employees have loved is that now you still have the opportunity to make money even if you work a Tuesday night or a Wednesday lunch. And, um, you know, that's something that taking the money out of the pockets of the, the rock stars who are the ambassadors of your business, who are the ones that really, you know, kind of, and, and, and in turn, don't the, the newer people not have as much to aspire to when they see these servers who have these guests and make this kind of money. I mean, essentially if, if you're all kind of there, what's the incentive to really give your guests that experience? That's a, that's a great question. And I think what the modern has done and, and, and I'm not sure if we're going to model this hundred percent yet. So, because my Lino has yet to model it, um, in, in real life is, um, they've created uh, job classifications that are 100 level, 200 level and 300 level. And this is based on skill and testing and, and knowledge, you know, so it's, it's both sort of soft skills and technical skills. And now Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, so the idea is that if you are one of those rock stars, you will be at the 300 level, let's just say. So you will get a larger share of that uh, tip pool. Of, excuse me, no, that revenue no, share. No. After 23 years in a tip pool, it's, it's hard for me to, to no, so it's a, the weekly revenue share. Now, aren't we taking that? I mean, now, now you're essentially just saying, well, the boss can rate, you know, how well you do. I mean, in, in, in all honesty, you know, versus how willing you are to come in and favoritism and how long you've been there. But in the end, what if a rock star comes in and has only been there for two months? Isn't it really the customer who gets the experience and has the one to really genuinely show gratitude? And isn't that, isn't that kind of excluding the guests to be able to be a part of that? that that's a great – I mean, that's another great question. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we – you know, we owners and, and managers of our business will always have the say. I mean, I think that's that's something that, you know, is is part of, of running a business. And I and I think that's um, and, and I think that's an important thing, you know, whether it's how we schedule now, we schedule people how we schedule them, not just based on how nice they are, but it's it's how well we think you know, they can perform in certain sort of environments. You know, we don't put our newest bartender on Thursday night service, you know. Um, okay. we, we might put them on, you know, in the middle of the bar on a Tuesday night and, and sort of start there. But right now, those three bartenders, whether it's, you know, our senior person or our junior person on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night are making the exact same amount of money. Um, and and I actually think it's a it's a good thing that if you can be at different levels, you can we can say, wow, okay, I made fifty dollars more tonight or twenty dollars more tonight for it. Excuse me, this week, you know, looking over the whole week, um, because I'm at a higher level because I've tested higher and I've and I've performed better. Um, whatever the metrics are that each business creates, you know, I don't know what the Portslight metrics are going to be yet. I haven't right. you know really gotten into that yet. Um. You know, if we and I, it, you know, I know it's all in a model right now. But if we essentially follow the money, you know, right now we're mm -hmm. talking about, as all of us know, our, our industries are seasonality. You know, winter is, and especially January is typically. I mean, I can see a lot of servers saying, "Great, I'm making good money in January right now," and it's usually slow, and I have this guaranteed money, which I, I agree is a whole other side of the tipping issue. But if you know, if they're at a, if essentially if servers are going to just this, you know, all year round, we're going to make the same money. We're going to be on salary. We're going to be on hourly. So where does this increased revenue that now that we've raised prices, you know, summertime we're we're kicking it up high. We're doing great volume. Everything's increasing. Servers are now staying the same. Cooks are now staying the same. Isn't essentially the the business or the restaurant group now kind of profiting based on this increase in prices? Now now where does that extra money go? Well, well, the revenue share will will vary based on the revenue of that week. So the your share of it, whatever percent you might get of that, but a a the second week of December is going to have higher revenue, probably than the third week in January. So, so is the revenue share at eighteen to twenty percent of sales? I, I'm gonna have to punt on that one because I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. 
what the percentages are right now. And for our business, it, it'll be different than, um, you know, something like the modern whose check average is, I think, three or four times what, what ours is here. Right. Um, so I don't have, I don't have that answer. Um, okay. I, so I'll just plead that I don't know. No, no, no. Um, I do think actually, I don't know if we want to pick it. We have some questions pobbling yeah, in. Let's get, yeah, let's, let's, uh, well, I'm going to let you, uh, I'm going to let you kind of gather what, if you have any questions that you want to head up. Okay. So let's see. Oh, shoot. Let me just see here. What's going on here. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see which order these are in here. All right. You're kind of switching order. I'm not, <laughs> I don't really know. How did this work here? All right. In a high-end restaurant, how will the gratuity be determined if a guest orders several expensive bottles of wine? Well, um, it, that's, that's the gratuity. So again, we, we're not thinking of it as a gratuity. Um, we will increase the price of every bottle of wine. Um, now, honestly, if it's a $300 bottle of wine, we may not increase it as much as a $40 bottle of, bottle, bottle of wine because we may not be selling a lot of those $300 bottles of wine. And um, so that's going to be something that every, uh, every owner or manager or beverage director or sommelier is going to have to figure out based on what they sell. You know, um, it's like we do, you know, like how we price things right now, how, how we all price things right now, you know, our top, top selling cocktail, um, we want to make sure is priced and, and costed uh, appropriately. Um, similarly, you know, whether it's a, a burger or, a, you know, the surf and turf, you know, I think we have to decide how much we're going to raise each, um, each menu item. Um, let's see. So is there, I have another, I have a question from uh, Christina and it says, is there a way for customers to say if a server or an employee gave superior service? So do you have some type of incentive service set up so that if a, if a server or a bartender really goes out of their way, besides just leaving some cash on the table, or is there a way for their kind of, so how, especially if you guys are now essentially rating your servers, how does a server move up besides yeah. just basically a manager saying, oh, okay, they're, they're better. That, that's a really great, uh, you know, it's actually the paradigm, I, I guess it's kind of like the Uber paradigm. Um, uh, Danny, who, you know, obviously Danny Meyer, who came up with this uh, sort of gutsy thing to do in our company, um, we all, you know, certainly in New York City, we can't imagine a pre-Uber uh, time, you know, and, and traveling around, uh, getting from place to place. And Uber, at, at Uber, you don't tip. Um, but what you do is you rate um, you rate your driver, and so we are actually are um, uh, we've we've really sort of increased uh, our comment cards um, and things like that. So people do have a way that's non monetary to um, say, hey, you know, so and so gave a great great service. Um, we've also what what has been really interesting is that our number of comments on open table and our comment cards has drastically increased at the modern since we started and interestingly our rating has gone up considerably so there's a way you know on open table to know who your server was or for us to know who your server was um, and that's absolutely something that we will take into consideration because yeah if you're the manager's favorite or whatever we, we do want to have a way to um, to sort of be honest. And, you know, I like to think that we all have integrity, but, you know, humanity and human nature does come into, into play. Um, but we don't want to say service, hospitality is included, but nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you can leave me a 20. I think that gets into really um, dangerous territory um, because I don't, I think that takes our, away our integrity. Um, so we want to be really careful about that, frankly. Um, I will say that I learned, I just got a statistic last night um, from the managing director of the modern um, they currently have one percent tipping so there are still people who leave ten dollars twenty dollars and what they do at the end of the, at the end of the night is they distribute it according to the tip pool that night you know to a tip pool based on the same way they used to do it so you know you might make six bucks you know right. but we really want to discourage that and we frankly, believe that over time that'll go down um, because people do still feel good about, I guess, you know. 
So my, I, I love to tip. I, I tip my cab drivers. I tip my coffee makers. I, I tip as much as possible, but obviously I, I also have made my money that way a lot of my life. So, but my question is not only based on myself as being a tipped employee at a lot of the majority of my life, um, but I am a, an operator and, uh, you know, one of the things for me and one of the, the best parts is, is the cutting of the staff and the milking the clock. In general, yeah. servers don't, servers and bartenders don't milk the clock. I mean, we could, the $5 an hour or whatever, and, you know, we come in, we work hard, we work fast, we turn our tables and we get out. And now, aren't essentially, you're putting this, you know, where's the incentive for that? Aren't, aren't servers just going to kind of slowly milk the, I mean, if, if I'm now paid hourly am I, and, and I'm part of the tip pool based on how many hours I'm there, how is that fair to the staff that come in, they work their butts off and they leave when you have someone else and it's going to happen, whether we say it's not, it's not, you're going to have employees who come in and, you know, kind of hang out over here. Or they, you know, find themselves scared. So they're walking around because shit, if I work 10 hours today and I've got $9 an hour and I work 10 hours and I'm a part of the tip pool, where's that incentive for let alone the other staff, but people to, come in, do their job, do it well, doesn't that kind of promote laziness? Uh, well, I, the short answer is I don't believe it does, um, okay. but I think it's also, I think we can hold each other accountable. Um, you know, interestingly in a tip pool, having worked in a tip pool and then for, you know, really most of my career lately, not being in a tip pool, but being involved with a tip pool, um, one of the beauties of a tip pool compared to a non-tip pool is that people do try to hold each other accountable. And, uh, you know, you get, get a lot of, yeah, that would be awesome, you know. And, you know, they ask the manager, you know, hey, can I, can Jane go home now? She finished her side work. Um, this won't be that different. Um, and ultimately, it will come down to the, you know, the closing manager at the end of the night saying, all right, we're good. We'll send two of the four servers and one of the three bartenders home. Uh, because that will make, a difference. It, it absolutely will make a difference. Um, it won't make a difference that night, meaning you won't say, you won't be able to see, oh, I made $5 more because Jane went home early. Um, but at the end of the week, what our hope is, is that people will start start to say, okay, it makes sense the, the managers under, you know, the managers are looking out for all of us. And um, it's really important that, you know, they send people home. And I think and ultimately, if, if there's someone who consistently is is having a, a you know is not really following the the culture of what we're trying to do, you know, we'll have different conversations with those people. Right. I just saw a question. I don't know how these are moving, but it was a question yeah, that. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, it's a little weird, but there's a question from Deke Gilbert that I actually had as well. And how is this how is this affecting? Not only, I mean, obviously, once you have rate wage increases, now we have um, tax tax increases, and in, and in, in the owners paying more taxes, and then we also have workman's comp because I know, you know, for us, obviously, workman's comp is based on on those issues. So, how is that affecting your bottom line there? Uh, that that is actually one of the things that concerns me the most, um, frankly, and and because I think just if if you're going to make the servers whole then what about the other taxes? And and that's something that we are currently, I mean, you mentioned two of the obvious ones, but then there's other things like a lot of a lot of people have percentage rent deals. So if if a landlord is getting a percentage of sales, what some of our places are doing is we're we're speaking to landlords and trying to normalize what those numbers are based on uh, hospitality included. Um, I don't know the outcome of that. In fact, there's no outcome just yet. Um, and the other one is credit card commissions. Um, right. Because if, if Amex is getting 3% and now they're getting 3% of a larger number, um, we are starting some conversations with, with them. In the meantime, remember what I said, like in, in the meantime, in, in the short term, the you know investors and, and management and um, owners are sort of taking a hit while this process is going on. We ultimately hope that we'll be able to, um, you know, have sort of make some headway with people like landlords and even credit card companies. Well, if it's, um, if, and maybe I'm just doing the math wrong, but if it's twenty percent, if you if you've increased prices and they're not tipping, isn't essentially? I mean, because when people most, in my experience, most of the time people tip on credit cards, and that that kind of just gets passed off to the house as well. So. 
Um, is the house really paying more if it's if it, if the tips are in credit cards or if just the menu in price increases in credit cards? Well, no. We, I mean, um, I, you actually cut out for a little bit there, but oh. I, but um, yes, I mean, we are paying more. The, the business is paying more. Okay. So yeah, and that that's the sort of thing that that we have to, you know, that we have to grapple with, and and um, you know, I think the modern had about a twelve week planning period, and then it's going to be about twelve weeks between the time the modern launched and the time Myelino launched, and I think that's something that um, there's a lot of learnings that are in there that Myelino has has already learned from uh, from the modern. And I believe it's going to be the next, you know, the same as we go down with our with our other uh, businesses. Um, you know, I think since Quartz Light is our only bar, we'll probably be towards the end of the rollout. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, a year from now, when when you speak to me, I'll, I'll actually be able to say I actually know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so, um, but right now, I mean, I'm actually we're watching that in terms of the increased cost structure. I think that is something that's very a big concern of me as as a co-owner here. Um, a question from Mark. Part of the damage done to the industry here is that this model isn't replicable. To think that union, uh, your group algorithms could be adopted from four star to no star place is unrealistic. It's irresponsible uh, within the scope of the industry, not revolutionary. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, how? I mean, obviously your your model is is different, but do you think that uh, all the way down to the mom and pops that this is something that can be? Kind of done yeah. nationwide. I, I think it. I think really, ultimately, it comes down to each owner. I mean, I, I mean, we are not. We believe this is right for us and and our um, and our employees and our guests. Ultimately, um, I think irresponsible. That's really. I guess that's that's you know in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, I think we we are capitalists. You know, so it would be it would be irresponsible of us to do something that we feel would damage our. Uh, employees' livelihoods, and certainly our, you know, our, our purveyors and our communities. I mean, that would that would be something that would be irresponsible. And so we are we are putting a lot of thought into this so that we believe um, we can all come out better ultimately. Um, also, the other thing is certainly in New York City, we've seen quite a few other people, uh, other restaurants. Not and not just restaurant groups, you know, not just Eleven Madison Park, um, you know, um, you know, super high end places like Huertas, which is a which is a, a small uh, restaurant in the East Village, you know, who who's probably a lot more like Porchlight in a lot of ways in terms of its revenue. Um, they rolled it out uh, about six weeks ago, and so we're really excited to hear to see how they to, how, how they're doing it. Um, a bar in the East Village just rolled it out, um, and I'm not sure how it's going there yet. Um, but I'm very eager to 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 meet with them and, and sort of see how it's going with them. So I, I think ultimately, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I say ultimately it's up to each owner and, and to see how it works. Could work for them. I got a message from someone in um, Boston who has is a consultant and has a couple different places. Um, and I, I got a message from them. They're, they're doing something a little bit different, which I, I really, not to completely just open up the whole thing, is I'm happy to report. Uh, what they did is they did a 3% uh, increase. And that 3% goes 100% to just the kitchen staff alone. And what they said is that when distributed 100% and equally among the kitchen staff, according to hours worked, resulted at $2.54 per hour pay bump at one restaurant and at $2.05 in another for up to seven cooks. They haven't seen an impact on sales and tips for servers were actually slightly higher. So in, in Ascension, you know, these guys have essentially raised menu prices 3% to com compensate for the back of the house, but the servers are still left to make their tips and, and the, the tipping culture is still there. And then there's also the whole side for the difference in servers and bartenders where essentially bartenders are the, the cooks. We're making the drinks. You know, especially we're, we're doing all of this work and we're dealing with the guests. How come a bartender can be responsible for now paying the back of the house a higher wage when there's really not, I mean, there's, there's, except the random bar food, the bartender is really kind of doing, they're doing the server, they're being the chef, they're being the ambassador, they're, they're creating the relationship. So where does that kind of fall into place? 
Yeah, but I think that sounds like a really creative solution. I, I don't think it was an option for us. Um, it, are they, did they just raise prices or did they add a 3% they service They did a 3% charge? hospitality charge. It's on the, on the check. Um, yeah. They also tell their guests about it and that related into obviously a, a very nice increase. But in addition, the, the servers are still making their tips uh, and they mm -hmm. have that reward incentive for turning tables and in pleasing guests and hospitality. Yeah, I mean, I know when we when we uh, looked into doing a service charge, um, we determined with with you know our people who knew about these things that um, that wasn't something that we would be able to do. Um, that so we uh, you know I I don't know really how the laws are different in Massachusetts compared to right. New York, but, but we determined that that was something that we could not do. So um, we chose not to do that. I mean, I've even seen that in other places. I live in New Jersey. I've seen, you know, like healthcare surcharge and, and you know, stuff like that. Um, I'm not even sure if that's a good idea. I'd rather just raise the prices yeah. a dollar. I mean, that's a little cheesy, but um, I, I do want to go back to the thing about taking from, you know, the bartenders. I mean, at Porchlight, certainly the bartenders are the most highly compensated people here. And, and we believe that's right. And, and, you know, because I, I agree with you, you know, they're the center of the stage. 75% um, of our sales is, is alcohol here. Um, so I absolutely agree. And, and I, I, you know, that will continue. I mean, that's, that's definitely, um, so we're not looking to have it be, you know, everyone makes X per hour, whether you're, you know, a starting dishwasher or you're a head bartender with 10 years experience. Uh, so we still, really want people to work through their careers. And, you know, we want that bar back to have incentive to, to learn more or that, you know, prep cook to learn more, um, to become, you know, to go move up a level, um, to be compensated more. Um, so I don't believe that this takes away motivation. Um, you know, I remember when, you know, when I first worked in a tip pool, that was one of the things, you know, is that going to take away my motivation? And, you know, for some people it does. Um, but I think it's our job to sort of, manage that and, and sort of say, hey, um, we have to pay attention. You know, you can't, you, just like you can't milk the clock, you can't milk the tip pool, and you can't milk the revenue share. You know, I think that's, you know, that ultimately that will be our job as leaders to, to sort of monitor that and see how we're performing. Um, another question here is, uh, what will the transparency be like with profit share financials? Um, will employees be aware of where their number comes from. Yes, absolutely. And and I'm gonna I corrected I want to correct myself. Um, it's not profit share, it's revenue share. Um, um, but uh, absolutely we were we are sharing the modern has really raised the bar for us um, in terms of transparency and and I'm very impressed with them. <laughs> um, they share a lot. Um, and um, I haven't been to a staff meeting there in a while but um, Absolutely. And just as much as now, you know, we have a tip pool and um, every night a server can see what the revenue was and what their share of the tip pool was on a nightly basis. We're going to still do the same thing on a weekly basis um, once we have the revenue share, because absolutely that's something that's that's imperative. Uh, if we're going to ask our team to have faith in us, we need to to really be transparent and, and share with them those inform that information. So thank you, A.D. Peterson. So I've mentioned, I, I personally think this kind of goes back to more of a minimum wage legislation um, um, issue. But one of the one of the things that I was talking to, to Morgenthaler about, which he brought in, up an issue that obviously does, I mean, Bismarck, but Portland I can see is essentially, um, especially in these smaller outskirts neighborhoods, what makes a neighborhood grow and become unique and trendy and hip is the small businesses that find these little neighborhoods, move into them, make these neighborhoods great, then the neighborhood is now escalated, and you have all these people wanting to come in, move in, rate, you know, rents go higher, menu prices go higher, and essentially you're pushing out the people who have now built up these, these great neighborhoods. Is, is, isn't this just kind of feeding into that, as opposed to going back and, like I said again, you know, using our, our restaurant lobbyists and using the power that especially a group like you guys have to sit down with legislation and say, okay, we need to work on the, the minimum wage increase, especially for maybe this industry and work on a tip credit. And as opposed to just feeding into it and now trying to put a bandaid on it, essentially not only aren't we 
feeding into it, but now aren't we just kind of destroying the neighborhoods that we've created? Wow, that's a, there's a lot in there. We just, uh, destroying the grids, <laughs> I guess we like to think of it as the reverse of that. I mean, when um, when I started at Union Square Cafe in 1992, it was a really good place to buy heroin, you know? So um, I'm really, I'm kind of glad um, that you can't get heroin there anymore. Um, I, am I, um, you know, am I, sometimes dismayed that there's a bank on every corner in Union Square? Yeah, kind of. Um, did our success in some way contribute to that? Maybe. Um, but uh, I, I also think that's kind of a natural part of capitalism. And, um, you know, Blue Smoke was very similar. Um, the, you know, the, the most common car on uh, 27th Street when we opened Blue Smoke in 2002 was a, was a cop car. And, uh, and a white Escalade um, for all of the pimps, you know, so. Yeah, maybe I'm not necessarily saying like the, like the, that kind of client, uh, not clientele, that kind of, of, of neighborhood. I'm saying more that, you know, if we, and I, obviously I know we're talking about New York City, but I mean, if you have, if I, when I'm in a neighborhood and I want to go serve, I'm going to go to the, the closest restaurant to my neighborhood. And once prices start increasing, I now have to, to essentially leave my neighborhood that I helped build to go find somewhere cheaper to live. And, and just for example, in Seattle, I was just there interviewing chefs and the market there is so saturated. You know, they're all now looking to smaller markets, which is great for me. Um, but, you know, aren't we kind of pushing out the people that helped us grow into big cities? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, I've, I guess it, it's hard for me to answer that because I've been in the big city for the past 24 years. And uh, I mean, I, I like you, I, I moved from, from Vermont, so you know, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't really know how to answer that. Actually, I mean, I think that's that's something that is a tricky one. And uh, I guess if you got, you know, Fox News and MSNBC on either side, we'll, we'll be able to get uh, really divergent opinions on that. I think let's uh, leave them out of this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. In a union environment, a sea change like this would most likely be near impossible to implement, especially in the case of multi-unit operator like yourself. If you have locations, say airports or hotels, how do you prevent the, that's, so I, I Randy, uh, excuse me, Rocky, um, you know, in a union environment, I, I have no experience with union environments. So I, I don't know if I can answer that. Kate, I mean, do you have any experience? Um, no, I, I, for, for me personally, even as much time as I've spent in Vegas, the, not a lot of, of union work that I've done or that I'm experienced with. I don't, I don't have a lot to say on that. Yeah. So I, I wish I could, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to plead ignorance on that one. Um, yeah. you know, it's interesting because, you know, when I started in, I, you know, back in the dark ages, it was one of those things where a lot of times you could work for a small place and you'd be really well mentored. But a lot of times you were paid under the table and, and you, know, you might be working with this really creative chef or, or you know, sommelier or something like that. But sometimes the pay structure was kind of sketchy or you could work at a hotel or a union environment and there was very little uh, sort of inspiration. Um, but you knew you had a great paycheck and you might have had some sort of uh, retirement plan. Um, you know, what we're trying to do at USHG is, is try to still maintain a lot of that creativity while still make it a little bit more, uh, you know, easier to sort of grow with us. Um, I'll tell you, I wouldn't have been a host. Uh, I wouldn't have gone from a host to, um, you know, a partner um, if I didn't feel like USHG was taking care of me. Um, and, and, you know, I hope there's a lot of other people who do that. And I hope that hospitality included will sometimes help, somehow help that. Um, so we'll see. Have you seen any, um we all know the back of the house, front of the house battle, no matter how much we love it or hate it, or we're all friends or we go out and have a beer after work, we still have it. Um, I, you know, I always tell my, my servers, and of course, it, like, this is one of the issues of tipping, don't talk about, don't talk about these tips, period, but don't, don't go back in the back and ask me, man, I killed it tonight, you know, this guy's slaved, and, and then you, you work into the, you know, tipping the kitchen out and the legalities of that, but have you seen any type of, you know, animosity from the front of the house that now they're pretty much giving what comes out of their pocket to the back of the house? No, I, no, and I'm not going to let you get away with saying that. So I'm just going <laughs> to say it 10 times, but I'm not. Now, it's more like, you know, the guests. Okay, and we're taking it from the guests. And 
Um, but no, in fact, so far, um, the, um, the back of house has been um, the, the the number of applicants for the back of house at the modern has increased. I have I have it written here somewhere, some astronomical, like hundreds of percent. Um, and the turnover in the front of house has has been remarkably low. You know, traditionally, as as many of you you know or who work in seasonal businesses, um, January is always sort of a great bloodletting. Um, where everyone works the holidays, they make their money, and then they decide to go travel or do a tour or, or you know something like that. Um, January at the Modern has has been great, um, so that's really reassuring for me. Um, I will say that you know they're still in the guaranteed sort of um, floor uh, period, so you know I think that ends in a few weeks. So so that's going to be something that we'll want to watch. You know um, when things get more sort of real. Um, but so far, the numbers have have been great for the front of house and the back of house. So it's it's been a really positive thing. So I think I just may have figured this thing out now that we are down to the end. But there's one question I think um, a lot of people have. I, I think we had to select it. But if you look up at the top right hand corner, how is the policy being conveyed to the guests? How do they find out when the check is dropped? Um, and have you had any guests who have had issues with it? Um, the so. First of all, we've done a lot of this, um, and Danny has has done as many um, radio uh, um, interviews, and he's been on you know CBS and CBS This Morning, and uh, and our my colleagues and and at USHG who really kind of came up with this plan have been um, holding town halls. Last night I, I was at a town hall um, for guests of Myelino, which was, which is pretty cool, and I think there are about fifty people there. Um, but also our, um, it's printed on the check, um, it's printed on the menu, um, and um, it's something that when people people do ask, and, and then they're sort of awkward first month, a lot of people were saying, wait, excuse me, where's the tip line? And and um, actually I was talking to a captain at, at the Modern um, last night, um, and she was she was describing how even though there's no tip line, people are writing, you know, the tip. Tips um, yeah, and like there's nowhere to write it, so they're writing it like at an angle on the, you know, and you know, so the servers are going back and saying, you know, I just want to let you know, actually, hospitality is included. You don't need to tip. Thank you very much. And you know, to which I'm thinking, people are probably saying, God, I yeah, that's good because I thought your prices were really high. You know, um, yeah. I, I'm not sure if that's true, but people have been relieved. Um, there have been a few people who said who I think were probably in that awkward stage. Well, oh shoot, well I just left fifty bucks. I'm not going to take it away now. Um, but I think that'll diminish over time. So it's really everything. Um, also, the reservationists are when they confirm reservations, um, they're explaining that um, to you know a place like the Modern is almost all reservations. Um, whereas you know Portslight, we don't take reservations, so it's going to be a little more challenging. That's going to be a major challenge that we need to somehow um, communicate, and that could get weird. Hi, welcome. You're going to be two. Just want to let you know, hospitality is included. That could get like kind of trite. Uh, pretty quickly, um, and is it the? I mean, like, when is it the guest responsibility to know which place tip? I mean, is it on your? I'm sorry, is it on your menu? Yes, it's on the menu uh, okay. and on the check. So really, think, it's the guest responsibility to know if I'm in a tipped inclusive or, or hospitality inclusive and non environment. But I think that I mean to be to be honest, I think it's going to be months, if not you know a year, before we really feel like we've nailed it in terms of communicating. You know, I also think, you know, like Tom Colicchio, I think some of his restaurants are doing, uh, you know, hospitality or service included. You right. know, I think the more people that talk about it, uh, certainly in New York, I think the more it'll become, I'm not saying the norm, but I think people will then know to ask, like, oh, is this one of those places? Hot topic. I mean, I know just in Minneapolis, my owner was traveling and she said it was on the front page of one of their newspapers. I think smaller markets are taking a look at it. I just wonder when, when we're putting almost too much on the guest to kind of be in charge of this, you know, I need to know exactly where I am and what kind of service it is and what kind of restaurant it is and do I tip and are they tip, you know, hospitality inclusive or is it a situation where I can or I can't? Then there's restaurants who are, uh, I, I read one restaurant who's doing hospitality inclusive, but now any tip left over goes to charity. So when, is it, Ooh, is it now that everyone's doing all these different things, where's the responsibility? It's kind of like at a certain point, is the guest going to be like, "Man, screw this, I'm out." You know, I don't want to have to. I don't have to tip. 
<laughs> like I brought my tablet to let me know which one's yeah. which. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be, I, I do think it's going to be a while, you know, I think it's going to be a long slog and, um, you know, I fielded countless, um, phone calls and emails from our colleagues around the country. Um, last night at this town hall, um, that I attended, uh, there was a restaurateur from, uh, from, uh, from Tennessee, and she was saying, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of doing this, but no one in Tennessee is doing this yet. Um, so there's a lot of questions uh, out there, and um, you know, I think we'll we'll each find our our path. You know, um, I will tell you that it's we're really heartened by the success of the modern. I mean, if that had gone poorly, I think this would be a very different conversation. I'd be more apologetic and defensive and. Um, but since it's gone so well, it's been kind of like, hey, this is actually pretty good because I'm I'm a pretty skeptical person. Right. Um, so. But, and uh, say, sorry, uh, can you remind me how long you've been doing this? When we say the success of it, it's uh, we're done talking. Uh, three months. It's it's three months, so it's still okay. short. Right. Yeah, it's still it's still very short. But the good news is, and and part of the the genius of um, the people who thought of this, not I, um, is that it was during sort of a build up month one of the busiest months of the year and one of the slower months of the year. Right. So I think, you know, starting this, you know, depending on the seasonality of your business during the slowest month of the year might be kind of silly, um, you know, because if it's already, you know, it's a tough competition and, and your revenue is already down 25% and then you raise your prices 20 or 25 or whatever your number is. And then all of a sudden people are choosing another place because it's less expensive on paper that could be that would be really something you want to consider in terms of the timing of things um and i, and I believe the people at the modern really you know sort of considered that um so this way they could say okay in those first 90 days what sorts of business are we are we touching right well i think um we're getting to a point where we need to to wrap it up i do want everyone to know that Obviously, this is a huge issue. There's tons and tons of angles, and, and it, it affects different markets and with tip credits and minimum wage and, and all kinds of things. I encourage everyone to go to the Facebook page where we started the event or where you may have RSVP'd and continue the conversation, ask questions. You know, there's tons. Of, I mean, I talk to, I mean, I talk to the guys, you know, that I talk to Dushan and I talk to the owners of EO. I talk to Jack and Sean, who I know are, are working with you guys. and. I talked to Sean Kenyon in Denver and Nick Talley in, in Vegas and everybody, every market has their own thing. So, you know, I encourage everyone to, to be open and constructive about the topic. You know, we're all here for the same end result. No one's here to, to bash or badmouth anyone else. This is all, everyone sees a problem. We all just need to get together and figure out the best way to fix it as a group. So continue the discussion, go on the Facebook page, ask people what they think. And, you know, I think in the end, everyone who's trying to do something, whether it works or it doesn't work, it's just all a role model and, and a, a way for us to kind of look at this whole thing and figure out maybe, you know, bringing us ourselves together as opposed to really attacking people. I don't think anyone has done this with ill will or malicious intent. I think we're all just trying to figure out ways to battle it. So instead of, you know, saying, oh, how could you do this? Or if we all come together and really work on getting a great system, it might be able to be implemented in more places and we won't be confusing everybody, you know? Yeah. And I look forward to uh, seeing you all down at uh, Tales in July. I'm sure we'll be talking about it then. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Go to the Facebook page. Ask your questions. Feel free to Facebook me. I mean, you know, I encourage you to, to late night message Mark as in three hours in the morning, wee hours. Um, right. You can get a hold of me in the day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank all right. you all very much. Thanks, Thanks so much, Kate. guys. All right.